Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Paul Keeley. I'm the Chief Operating Officer uh, at the National Low Income Housing Coalition <clears throat> and the Forum MC. Um, <clears throat> so I always like to start with a little fact uh, to get our juices flowing. In no state in the United States is the minimum wage sufficient to rent a one bedroom apartment at fair market rent earning the minimum wage in no state. This map from our out of reach report shows how many hours you would need to work to afford the fair market rent for a one bedroom apartment in your state. So we can see that in Virginia, you'd have to work 97 hours a week. In California, 92 hours a week. In New York, 98 hours a week. Um, again, no state does 40 hours a week make it. A new out of reach will be coming out in May to update these figures. Like, well, so many people, of course, many single moms, many single fathers are working minimum wage with kids. And they need two bedrooms. So what about a two bedroom fair market rent? For a two bedroom fair market uh, rent apartment, an individual would have to work 112 hours a week nationally. That's 2.8 full time jobs. Basically, that is working every hour you don't sleep, assuming you sleep eight hours a day. That's what we're up against. All right, we had a great day yesterday, the residence session focusing on RAD, Section 3, affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, <clears throat> we had our session on extreme poverty in the United States with um, our guests, Catherine Eden and, and Sharon McDonald and, and Sheila. We had our session with our panel on housing and the election, and we have so much more uh, to cover today. So. I'm going to start us off first by, again, thanking our sponsors and special members. I'd like to do a special shout out to some of our marquee sponsors. Um, Bank of America, is Brian Tracy here? Yeah? Not yet. Um, BBVA, uh, Rayo Cañas, I don't think is here yet. Um, JP Morgan Chase. I don't think Rodney has arrived yet, although they're all coming. And then um, to our real platinum sponsor, somebody who's been with us for many, many years, an organization that has been incredibly committed to the cause of ending homelessness and focusing on housing poverty. We could not do what we do without them. Uh, Janice Elliott from Melville Charitable Trust, can you just wave? Where is she? Thank you, Janice. An outstanding uh, partner with us. <clears throat> Again, thank you. OK, so for our um, new day two guests, so I know we have a number of guests who weren't with us uh, yesterday. Just to review what's in your packet, there is um, the forum agenda, which will walk you through uh, everything we're going to do and when. <clears throat> we have um, the. 2016 GAP report, and I'd just like to ask everyone to focus on this and make sure that if you read one document over the next few days, you read at least the summary of this report and you look through and look carefully at the graphics in it. It is the reason that NLIC exists. It's a phenomenal report, just came out. Uh, it's getting a lot of attention in the media. Um, and it's really, really important information. Also in your packets is our <clears throat> compendium of everything you need to know about affordable housing and community development, our 2016 Advocates Guide. Again, I mentioned it yesterday. If you'd like to trade yours in for a flash drive, go back out to registration. They will do that for you. Thank you to PNC for their support uh, to help us create that and share that with you. Um, there's also the Congressional uh, Directory, the 114th 
Congress directories. Again, thank you to uh, Volunteers of America for that. We also have in your packet an invitation to an event with Matthew Desmond, the author of the incredibly important book, Evicted Poverty and Profit in the American City. That event will take place on April 28th, right here in this hotel. If you are in the DC area, please, please join us for that. Please go online and, and RSVP. It tells you where to RSVP on that invitation. Um, incredibly important book, and we would actually encourage you to encourage uh, members of Congress and their staff to uh, come for that as well. And then there's a save the date um, in your uh, packets as well. I don't actually have it on the slide, but April 2nd through the 4th next year is when we do be doing this forum again. Okay, um, just a quick review of the day. <clears throat> we have in the morning, we'll be hearing from our once and future leaders of NLIHC, um, talking about affordable housing, past, present, and future with Sheila Crowley and Diane Yentel. Housing in the media, there'll be a session on affirmatively furthering fair housing. At lunchtime, we will have uh, Secretary Castro join us, and there will be a process where you'll go out, grab some back box lunches, come back in, begin to eat, and then he'll come in right at noon. Uh, in the afternoon, we'll be talking about the Family Options Study, talking about the National Housing Trust Fund implementation, and then Senator Tim Kaine will be joining us to talk about housing and criminal justice reform. And then this evening, We'll have dinner with uh, Brenda Clement, Barney Frank, and others celebrating Sheila Crowley's uh, contributions at NLIHC and congratulating her on her retirement. And there will be another book signing opportunity. So if you come a little early to dinner, I'd suggest you come 6 o'clock or so. Dinner starts at 6.30. If you come a little bit earlier, early, you can um, buy a copy of the book, and get it signed by Barney Frank, his book, Frank, A Life, A Life in Politics. Um, on Tuesday, tomorrow, breakfast and lunch is you're on your own, uh, and folks are going up on Capitol Hill to meet with their congressional delegations. Tomorrow evening, there's a separate ticket, ticket required. Uh, if you have a ticket or if you'd like one, you can certainly go out to the registration desk we have our leadership reception honoring Representative Barbara Lee and Nancy Bernstein. Okay, and then just the last thing I will say is <clears throat> please go out and visit the tables out here. We have a number of our partners who have tables, and we have our own uh, legislative action center where if you need additional state and congressional district profiles for your trips up on Capitol Hill, we can print them out for you. You have many already. Uh, there's in information about NLIHC membership. Please, as Moise said yesterday, encourage all your friends, any organization uh, that you're associated with to become either an individual or an organizational member. Uh, information about United for Homes, information about our research, and <clears throat> want to encourage you to uh, tweet information for um, logging on is, is in front of you, and it's also on the screen here. The password is NLIHC, and the hashtag is NLIHC Live. And Malik, our um, communications specialist, informs me that we had over 25,000 Twitter impressions yesterday. Pretty impressive. All right. So yesterday I jokingly said that, you know, for, my, for the next three days, Sheila Crowley is, is my boss still, but actually she'll be telling me what to do, I think, for the rest of my life. So without further ado, here's Sheila Crowley. Right here. All right, so how do I work this? Let's see. Wait, am I going backwards? Oh, okay. 
There we are. Okie doke. Uh, so, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to day two of our uh, housing policy forum. Um, I hope you found yesterday to be as worthwhile as I did. I certainly felt a lot of energy and love amongst all of us who are assembled here. Um, so, uh, this is my, actually, I counted. Okay. Um, I counted up, this is my 18th and last NLIHC annual conference. Um, it's wonderful to see so many old friends here and uh, to meet uh, so many new friends. It doesn't really seem possible that this much time uh, could have passed. Um, I want to take a, a moment to, to note uh, with sadness that we have uh, lost many people over the years. Um, Dorothy Robinson, uh, Peaches Manning, Paulette Turner, Ann Bradshaw, and Patty Rouse were all active members of the coalition who we uh, have recognized at our events. Um, and of course, uh, we lost our godmother of our movement, uh, Cushing Dolbear. And I know their spirit is here with us today, and I know that they are pleased that we continue to come together to advance uh, the cause that they all uh, worked for. So I just have a few uh, thoughts to offer about where we've been and uh, where we're going. But first, let's take a look back. 1998, there's Sheila and uh, Bill Faith along with Rafa Torres. Is Bill in the room yet? Okay. All right, so here we move, uh, jump forward to 2016. I ask you, who has weathered the years better? 1998, I had one grandchild. 2016, I have six grandchildren. And that little baby from 1998 is a freshman in college. Oh, my God. Uh, 1998, whoops. Did I go back too far? Uh-oh. 1999. The housing wage was $11.08. 2016, the housing wage to be announced soon is $20.17. And they kept me on all these years, even though it was getting worse. Uh, let me go back. 1998, we had a federal budget surplus of 125 a billion dollars. Uh, today we have a federal budget deficit of six hundred and sixteen billion dollars. Uh, imagine the progress that we could have made if we hadn't squandered that surplus on uh, war and tax cuts. So, as I talked about yesterday, we have um, moved to a place here at NLIHC where we are naming the problem housing poverty. Um, and, and I have, I'm sad to report that housing poverty is much more acute now than it was when I showed up here in 1998. Um, and why is that? Well, first of all, um, we have a lot more poor people than we did. We had 7.7 .7 extremely low income uh, renters, 7.7 .7 million extremely low income renters in 1999, according to the American Housing Survey, 10.4 million extremely low income renters today, or in 2014, according to the American Survey, American um, Community Survey. Uh, and we also have a lot less housing than we did. So this is the map from our GAP report. Uh, for every 100 extremely low income households, there are only 31 affordable and available rental housing units. Some states it's worse, some states it's better, but in no states is it at all adequate. So whatever victories we claim, uh, we've built a lot of new units. We have uh, revitalized some public housing. We are on our way to ending homelessness among veterans. Um, we are certainly improving our systems a great deal. But we have to acknowledge that we are barely making a dent. And until we do something 
uh, big and bold uh, to reverse these numbers, we will fail in our efforts to educate our children and secure a uh, decent uh, life for our elders and our neighbors with disabilities and do all the other things that a good society does. So I have 10 observations that I think offer hope and uh, challenges. Uh, in 1998, uh, the housing discourse and policy was all about home ownership. The narrative was that home ownership was the answer to generational poverty, that homeowners were winners and therefore renters were losers. Um, I am very proud that NLIHC did not succumb to the enormous pressure that we were under to jump onto that homeownership train that finally um, led to the wreck of the world economy in 2008. And if there is any silver lining to the uh, Great Recession is that the recognition that a healthy housing market makes room for both homeowners and renters and that both are legitimate forms of housing tenure and worthy of support. Uh, number two observation, we have much greater acceptance now than we did then of the fact that homelessness is a housing condition first. Uh, the narrative in the early 2000s was about pathologizing homeless people. Homelessness was a, was a condition that was the problem of the people who experienced it. Um, today, we are less likely to see housing and homelessness as, uh, as different problems, and we see them as gradations of one problem, and that is housing poverty. In 1998, those of us who were calling for deep income targeting, uh, uh, known as extremely low income targeting or ELI targeting in our jargon, we were the fringe. We had to fight like hell to keep deep income targeting in the National Housing Trust, off. We, Trust Fund. We had to fend off attempts from uh, many of our friends who tried to weaken it. We were told if you want to help the poorest, you have to help everyone else first, and it'll trickle down to get to them eventually. Today, there are very few people who would deny the data that the biggest housing problem is amongst the poorest people. And there, the evidence of that is that in 2014, when the Johnson Crapo um, ho housing finance reform bill came out of com uh, committee, um, that it devoted the lion's share of the, the new money that it created to the housing trust fund uh, for extremely low income renters. Um, and I know that NLIC can legitimately claim credit for moving the focus to the EL, to ELI housing uh, issue over the past many years. Uh, four, we've got a new program enacted. The National Housing Trust Fund is the first new low-income housing program since 1990. And of course, I am extremely disappointed that the amount of money is so small compared to the need and uh, compared to what it is that we envisioned when we started this campaign back in 2000. Um, I won't bore you with the details. You'll read my book. Um, the, the, the challenge uh, I leave behind to all of you is to make sure that the first two years of the National Housing Trust Fund are a smashing success so that uh, everybody is clamoring for more, and so more money will be, uh, be provided to the Housing Trust Fund, and that you hold the line on the $4 billion that was in Johnson Crapo for the Housing Trust Fund when housing finance reform uh, is inevitably enacted. Five, the mortgage interest deduction is no longer sacrosanct. Lots of people now actually say out loud that it has to get ch changed and you know they don't get struck by lightning. Uh, questioning the mortgage uh, interest deduction was a lonely space that Cushing occupied for a very long time and she would, I know, I know Cushing would be pleased with how far we've come uh, challenging this unfairness. But think about this, even if all we do, all we do is lower the cap on the tax break that you get uh, from million dollar homes to half million dollar homes. <laughs> uh, even if we did that from a million dollar mortgage to a $500,000 mortgage, um, we, and, that, and that would raise taxes on uh, fewer than 5% of, uh, of homeowners, we would have $95 billion over 10 years to invest in reducing housing poverty. And we can do much better than that 
in uh, reforming the mortgage interest deduction. Uh, so mortgage interest deduction reform is inevitable now. Uh, reinvestment of that money in low-income housing is not, and your challenge will be to hold on to that money when reform happens and not get, let it get moved to doing something else. So speaking of big money, um, we spend $80 billion a year to house 2.2 million people in our prisons and jails in the United States. And as we have incarcerated, incarcerated more and more black and brown men uh, over the last 20 years, the prisons have become a de facto part of our low-income housing system. Uh, we are now in a moment when this injustice may in fact be addressed uh, with bipartisan support, uh, and we have to make sure that housing is part of what that response is. You're going to hear more about this today from Secretary Castro and from uh, Senator Kane, um, but I want to emphasize that the housing response has to be more than making the existing housing supply accessible to people who are coming out of prisons, because as you know, there's a lot of people already competing for that housing. Uh, so the answer is not just to uh, make housing accessible to them, is to expand the housing supply so that there will be enough for everybody. Um, it has to do with redirecting some of that uh, money that we have put into our prison system into making sure that we have housing and jobs for people who come out of prison. Let's not repeat what happened when we deinstitutionalized public psychiatric hospitals in the 70s and 80s and failed to have a housing response um, that went along with that. Um, my seventh observation is that I want to just take a moment to talk directly to the public housing residents who are here with us today. Um, uh, and I know that your homes and communities are disparaged by outsiders and that you're angry at the conditions that, uh, and that your housing is in with the disinvestment and an aging public housing stock. Of course, you're mad when um, uh, uh, conditions deteriorate and you feel disrespected. You know that because of public housing, you would, without public housing, you would be in much worse shape because you would have to be out there competing in this really scarce housing market. So no wonder you fight so fiercely to protect the housing that you have. But I want you to remember and understand that public housing will only survive to serve another generation if the federal government commits more investment in housing for all low-income people. And so I urge you to please put the considerable skills you have developed uh, in protecting uh, public housing that we have now and turn to becoming an advocate for uh, ending housing poverty for everybody. We need to do both. Thanks. Uh, my eighth observation is that in the last year we made a great leap forward in housing history and in housing justice with the Supreme Court decision on disparate impact and the issuing of the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule by, uh, by HUD. Uh, it, it is one of the great accomplishments of the Obama administration that the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule is, is finally out. Um, so we have new tools now to combat housing discrimination against people who are members of the protected classes. But because objections to affordable housing in many communities are often thinly veiled objections to having people of color live there, um, the affirmatively furthering fair, uh, fair housing rule will be an essential tool in helping us expand both affordable housing and housing choice uh, for low-income people. <coughs> so I urge you to learn about this tool, uh, to take it home with you, and to um, embrace this process as we go forward. It will be very tough, um, but we have a good start uh, with, the, with the rule that we have. Ninth point, 
Um, income inequality is no longer uh, the subject of dry discourse in DC think tanks and, and in academia from Occupy to the Sanders campaign. Income inequality has now become the central moral issue of our time. Better wages and better benefits are both going to be essential elements to ending housing poverty, and we have to be part of that movement. Let me close um, by saying that I know that there's lots, lots more work to do, um, and I am confident that I am leaving the National Low Income Housing Coalition at a time when it has uh, never been stronger. Um, you have a terrific board of directors, uh, you have some really loyal and great funders. We need more, but we, have, we love our funders that we have. We have a growing membership, and we have a reputation for integrity and commitment. Uh, nobody doubts how genuine our uh, commitment is to the mission that we, uh, that we espouse. Um, and I also want you to know that I leave behind, um, I think, a really fabulous staff. And so I want you to indulge me for just a moment to call out on each one of them. And I'm going to start with the newest folks and move to the, the uh, not the oldest folks, but the folks with the longest, uh, the greatest longevity. Huh? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, and I don't think everybody's in the room, but I, but hope if you could, sir, if you could bring them in, that would be great. So, Sarah Jemison and James Sacedo are our new bright, organi bright young organizers. <laughs> Josephine Clark is the executive assistant. Uh, Josephine anticipates what I want and need. It's really wonderful. And she keeps me on time and on track, and uh, she will uh, continue to be a great asset to the, to the coalition, I hope, for many years to come. <laughs> With Josephine. Andrew Arndt is our new Vice President for Research. Andrew here, there's Andrew. Um, Andrew has, he's already proven his ability to take our research to, to new heights, and uh, I look forward to following his uh, career and his scholarship with, um, with great interest. Uh, Malik Akbar. Um, Malik is a self-admitted occupant of cyberspace. Um, and uh, he masterfully pushes our message, uh, messages out uh, far and wide, and we are uh, delighted that he has joined our team. Uh, Renee Willis. She's our Vice President for uh, Field and Communication. She is the ultimate multitasker in this job. And she carries it off with calm and grace and poise. She is completely unflappable. Um, uh, Ellen Errico. Where's Ellen? Ellen is our uh, graphic um, uh, designer and uh, web manager. And she's the one who makes all the rest of us look really good by turning our ideas into things that are very pretty. Um, you have an example of that right in front of you. It uh, makes it very uh, accessible. And she does it all with a ready smile. You can go to, uh, I can go to Ellen. I do this regularly with, uh, you know, multiple last minute tweaks, and she handles it all um, with com complete aplomb. Um, Paul Keeley is our COO. <laughs> And it was a lucky day indeed for NIC when Paul decided to come our way. He is a great leader. He's a great manager. He's a great detail guy. Um, he is always upbeat, unrelentingly upbeat. It's wonderful. Um, and, uh, and, and another one of his many great attributes is that he frets over our investments and the status of our stocks um, as if they were his very own. Um, so we have a he has a careful eye on the stock market. Um, Elaine Weiss. She's 
She's our uh, housing policy analyst and our resident uh, JD, and she uh, comes with a sunny disposition, a sharp intellect, and she has extraordinary political instincts for uh, what's going on on the Hill. Uh, Dan Emanuel. <laughs> Dan is a man of few words and very deep thoughts. Um, and uh, he has uh, moved from the, being on the field team as an organizer to uh, being a research analyst. He's made this uh, seamless transition, and, um, and I'm uh, delighted that, that Dan is also one of our resident MSWs and uh, has taken on uh, supervising uh, MSW students this year and is a great asset to the coalition. Uh, then we have um, Joseph, a.k.a. Joe, a.k.a. Joey Lindstrom. <laughs> um, uh, he's our senior organizer, uh, Joey. I, I, will, I will succumb to that. He is a man of many hats and ready quips. Um, and he has, uh, he has, with considerable organizing skills and experience that I am very glad to say he puts to our cause, he could be hired off and work for anybody, but he sticks it out with us, and we are um, extremely uh, fortunate. Uh, Christina Sin. Wow. Where is she? Christina Sin. Um, Christina is our development coordinator. She started off as my uh, assistant, and she is known as the Energizer Bunny, who, who loves fundraising. She loves it. She's like this, she's, she just likes, gets such a kick out of it. And she's so, so she's really good at it. And, um, and not only that, you know, she's like this person who helps everybody in the office get everything done. So, uh, Christina, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that you came our way. Um, uh, Ed Gramlich. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ed's title now is Senior Advisor. Um, <laughs> um, I, I actually don't know how many titles Ed's had over the over 10 years that he's been with us. He always introduces himself as the regs nerd. Um, uh, Ed breathes housing justice. He lives for housing justice, and he has an encyclopedic mind for every important rule and regulation that governs uh, our low-income housing system, and uh, he is a, uh, uh, a great asset and a great friend. Um, and last but not least, uh, let me uh, call out Karen Norris. So you should know that Kara uh, came to the coalition when she was 19. She's been here almost as long as I have been, uh, except she did this little, she, she took a little detour over to the YWCA, but she came back. Um, and um, uh, she, uh, she began as my assistant. She has worked her way through many roles. She is now the director of our administration. She is the linchpin of our work. If Kara is, if Kara is not there, Things don't happen, and so um, she is really central to everything that we get done. I am really proud of all that uh, Kara has achieved uh, over all these many years, and I'm really uh, proud to call her my friend. Um, let me just give a quick shout out to our interns who are here with us today, um, Alex Williams, Ikra Rafi, Garmang Leon, and Kate Rodriguez, who follow in the footsteps of hundreds of NLIHC uh, interns who we have sprinkled, embedded all over organizations and in uh, offices of power um, across, uh, across our um, city and across the country. Um, and they have all left infused with NLIHC values and are making great contributions. So finally, um, let me assure you that I am leaving NLIHC with great confidence in its future under the leadership of Diane Yentel. Uh, who I know you will embrace with great affection and respect. 
Uh, Diane is the future of our movement. She is deeply grounded in where we have come from, and she is full of new ideas and energy uh, for the future. She is the right person right now to take NLHC to new heights and greater victories. So, ta-da, as I head off into the sunset, <laughs> and let me brag a bit, this is the actual sunset in front of my new house. <laughs> I'm going to uh, leave you with a thought that I have, I have left you with before, but I think it is really, uh, really, really important. And this is in the words of Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it is done. Please join me in welcoming Diane. Thank you for such a warm welcome, and Sheila, thank you for that introduction. I think, as always, I think Sheila is being a little bit modest. <laughs> so I just want to recap um, that in one of the most difficult, mo one of the most challenging um, political and fiscal environments in recent memory, Sheila's unwavering leadership led to the creation of the National Housing Trust Fund new resources to house the lowest income people, and a, a, a first-of-its-kind program that will have a real impact on the lives of low-income people for years and decades to come. <laughs> and, and Sheila's legacy isn't just about the homes that she has helped to create and preserve, although it's certainly about that. It's also about the generation of advocates that she's inspired and mentored over the years. And I should know because I'm lucky enough to have been one of them. I'm, are, my slides are gonna come up at some point, right? <laughs> oh, I'm in charge, huh? Yeah. So I'm thrilled to be here today to, yeah, that's good. That's it. Whoops. All right. Hang on. Let's recap. Where have we been? Okay. So I'm thrilled to be here today to introduce myself to all of you and to talk about all that I believe we can continue to achieve together. The ache for home lives in all of us. That safe place where we can go as we are and not be questioned. Home is the foundation for all of our individual and collective success. When I first set out from home after college, determined to make the world a better place, I landed in a tiny village in Central Africa. As a Community Development Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia, I saw both the deepest poverty and the greatest resilience imaginable. And I learned that however humble the structure, the safety and security of home made learning, healing, and growing possible. Three years later, I was back in the US and I worked on a national research study that set out to examine the impacts of welfare reform on low-income women. I interviewed the women each month in their San Antonio homes where they told me about their struggles to make ends meet. And while they didn't talk about their struggles in these terms, they were making, the women were making real sacrifices every day. And the difference that affordable housing made in their lives was clear. Those without it often left medical bills unpaid so that they could buy diapers for the kids. Their electricity was shut off so that they had the money that they needed to fix their cars to get to work on time. And the women and their kids lived in constant fear of being evicted, and often they were, 
because despite their struggles and despite their sacrifices, they still couldn't get ahead, stay ahead, and pay the rent. Three years later, um, oh, sorry. So I had now this deep understanding of the importance of home. And with my, my degree in social work in hand, I started working towards changing affordable housing policy. This was back in 2001. I was at the Massachusetts Coalition for the Homeless as a housing policy coordinator. And it's when I first joined the National Housing Trust Fund campaign. And I first started looking to the National Low Income Housing Coalition and to Sheila's leadership as a guide. Several years later, I had the chance to move down to Washington, D.C. so that I could work for the Low Income Housing Coalition. And I learned a tremendous amount from Sheila about perseverance, tenacity, fearlessness, and de determined focus. I moved on and worked for a few other organizations, different segments of affordable housing from Oxfam America to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to Enterprise Community Partners. And throughout it all, Sheila and her leadership was, for me, as she has been for so many of us, she's been a mentor, a guide, a compass for our conscience. And so I just want to take a moment to personally thank Sheila uh, for all that she's given and all that she's done, for having been such a tireless and effective advocate for low-income people and their communities, and for being, to me, a mentor, a friend, and always an inspiration. Thank you, Sheila. It's an incredible honor to be stepping into the role of president and CEO of the Low Income Housing Coalition, especially during such a crucial and pivotal time. We have declining wages and skyrocketing rents, increased concentrations of poverty, rising levels of inequality, of wealth, income, and access to opportunity. Communities from Ferguson to Flint highlight the decades of federal, state, and local housing, transportation, and other policies that created and sustain communities of deep poverty, geographically cut off from opportunity. Groundbreaking research from Raj Chetty confirms that where we live, the city, the neighborhood, the block, even the street, has a profound impact on the opportunities we get in life. And in fact, of all the determinants that impact our ability to climb up the economic ladder, none is more important than home, place, the communities in which we are raised. And every year matters. Every year that a young child spends in a deeply poor community cements lifelong detrimental impacts. Everything from educational attainment to earnings to life expectancy. Today, 14 million people live in such deeply poor communities, and the numbers are rising, nearly doubling since the year 2000. The changes are felt most profoundly within communities of color. One in every four poor black families and one in every seven poor Latino families live in concentrated poverty. That's compared to one in every 13 poor white families. The research makes clear what we as housers have long known, that if we want to create and expand opportunity for the lowest income people, we have to start with home. And they have to be decent and safe and affordable homes. But wages are declining while rents are skyrocketing. More than 11 million people pay more than half of their income towards their rent each month and hundreds of thousands more have no homes at all. We in this room know very well, many of us are living this every day. The lowest income people feel this issue most acutely. The vast majority of extremely low income renters pay at least half their income towards their rent, and many pay much more, 70, 80, 90% of their income each month to have a home. 
And despite the obvious need, affordable housing is a rarity. The majority, most people, in need of and eligible for subsidized housing don't receive it. They wait in line to be added to years-long waiting lists or entered into housing lotteries, and in the meanwhile are left to fend for themselves in the private market. Only the lucky 23% get the help that they need. So the demand is increasing and the resources are shrinking, and the work of the National Low Income Housing Coalition has never been more important. Our cause has never been more urgent. The problems before us are daunting and can seem at times overwhelming. But when I look at the problems that we face and the people in this room and beyond, the people who make up the Low Income Housing Coalition, and when I think about the lessons of our past and the opportunities in our future, I feel tremendous hope and possibility. This country has tackled massive, seemingly intractable housing problems before. Through policies and programs, we worked to eliminate the blighted slums of decades ago, vastly improving the physical conditions in which most poor people lived. We created effective mechanisms to build, to finance, to build, to maintain housing affordable to low-income people through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Through innovations like housing choice vouchers and supportive housing, we ensured that some of the most vulnerable people in our community have access to housing they can afford and the services, the supportive services that they need to thrive. And communities across the country are ending homelessness among veterans. To continue making progress towards ending housing poverty, we have to keep working towards the bold, systemic change needed. Now, thankfully, the National Low Income Housing Coalition knows a little something about thinking big. The limitless uh, vision, tenacity, and perseverance of NLIHC's leadership, staff, members, funders, and partners created the National Housing Trust Fund, new dollars to build homes for the lowest income people. This was, I mean, you all remember, this was considered impossible, right? This was a pipe dream. Many thought it would never happen. But here we are, preparing for its successful implementation to build new homes for the lowest income people. Now, despite this tremendous achievement, there's still so much more to do. We have to stay vigilant to protect the trust fund against attempts to defund or eliminate it altogether. And our next great challenge is to find the resources to drive to the trust fund to greatly expand it to meet the demand at last. Now, the good news is that new resources doesn't necessarily mean spending more, right? It requires spending more effectively. So we spend $200 billion a year in this country to help Americans buy and rent their homes. And the bulk of these subsidies, a full three quarters of them, go to subsidize the homes of higher income homeowners, most of whom would be stably housed without the government's help. There's only a quarter of those subsidies left to go towards low-income renters, those with the greatest and the clearest need. In fact, we spend more each year to subsidize 5 million of the highest-income homeowners than we do to assist the 20 million poorest households combined. So if we're going to end housing poverty, we have to ensure that we are targeting limited resources towards the greatest need. It's time to rebalance housing policy. Yeah. Now, as Sheila said, there was a time when t even just talking about reforming the mortgage interest deduction was considered a third rail, right? Touch it at your peril. But we're seeing more and more smart reforms to the mortgage interest deduction being embraced by both Democrats and Republicans, in part 
because its costs are so high and its shortcomings are so glaring. And with tax reform again possible in the next Congress, we are prepared to advocate for the solutions needed to rebalance housing policy. The United for Homes campaign proposal to revise the mortgage interest deduction into a non-refundable capped credit worth a percentage of annual interest would both benefit the low-income homeowners and it would result in significant savings, $23 billion a year. Just imagine if we could instead spend those dollars, put those dollars to work through the trust fund, building homes for the lowest income people. And as we work to protect and expand the trust fund through MID reform, through GSE reform, potentially through criminal justice reform, we'll continue working to protect and expand other critical affordable housing programs to expand and improve programs like housing choice vouchers and supportive housing, housing for the elderly, housing for people with disabilities, the home program, the housing credit, and certainly we'll continue working to protect and improve the public housing program. We'll work to ensure that affordable housing exists for citizens returning to their communities after serving time in jails and prisons. We'll work to ensure a balanced approach to fair housing. So we will work to ensure comprehensive investments in the communities in need to protect existing affordable housing and create new homes in higher opportunity neighborhoods so that people, whether they're rich or they're poor, can choose where to live based on what's best for themselves and their families. And real choice requires that we work towards ensuring all communities are one of opportunity. And we'll continue working with partners to elevate the affordable housing crisis within the presidential campaigns and to be prepared to work with the transition staff of whomever is elected to offer concrete solutions and urge action early in the next administration. I believe progress is inevitable, and not just because it's the right thing to do, although it certainly is, right? Housing people, ensuring that low-income people and their communities have access to affordable housing has a huge benefit on those families and their, their communities. It equally benefits our country's economy and its future. Just last month, uh, my former colleagues at Enterprise released a study that showed that when people are affordably housed, their health care costs fell by 12%, proving that affordable housing drives down costs to the health care sector. And that's not all, right? We know this. It improves kids' educational outcomes. It improves their health outcomes. It acts as Dr. Megan Sandel, a pediatrician out of Children's Health Watch in Boston says, as a vaccine, protecting kids against a variety of social ills. Being affordably housed means we have more money to invest in our futures. According to the Harvard's Joint Center on Housing Studies, when we are affordably housed, we have five times as much to spend on health care, three times as much to spend on healthy food, and twice as much to save for retirement. We can save to pay down debt, to go to college, or even to buy a home. And affordable housing allows seniors to age in place, improving mobility, independence, quality of life, and further driving down health care costs. And so to be successful, to really achieve the systemic change necessary, I believe we need to expand our coalition beyond affordable housing and community development sectors, right? Because if we care about poverty, inequality, or economic mobility, if you care about health care, education, transportation, nutrition, if you care about local economies and creating jobs, then the solutions start with home. We will continue reaching out to and engaging and listening to people most impacted by these issues, people living in public housing and, and other subsidized housing, low-income people in need, 
as we craft and advance the solutions needed. And we will harness the incredible power and potential of social media to engage new audiences across generations and throughout communities to propel a movement to end housing poverty once and for all. In the coming months and years, I look forward to working with the talented and incredibly dedicated staff at the coalition, with our outstanding board, with our partners, and with each of you in this room to build off the tremendous success of Sheila and of the coalition and to continue expanding resources and opportunities for the lowest income people. As I tell my young sons many nights when we read their favorite bedtime story, peace is everyone having a home. I believe we can reach this goal together. Bold systemic change will be achieved by all of us here in this room. We know how to do this. We've done it before. And now it's time for us to get out there and do it again. And I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.